Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. Episode 82, and we have some news items to talk over this week that I thought were interesting. First off, we had talked about last week about lapses and uh, specifically about a lot of the breaches that have happened. Okta issued an apology, which I thought was very good of them to do. They, they basically admitted that they made a mistake in not disclosing it fast enough. And so I felt that was very good for them to at least come out and apologize for that and admit it that they made a mistake. More interesting enough, I saw two different articles. Number one, it talked about how immediately following the disclosure, Okta's stock dropped and dipped almost by 20%. And another article commented on whether or not this would be a good time to sell Okta and get out of that due to their disclosure of a data breach. And so I wanted to see what your thoughts were, Adam, because, you know, we had talked about a lot of times the cost of a data breach, and sometimes there's not really that much of an incentive these days. And interesting enough, the article that talked about if you should sell Okta, the end result and his his conclusion was that it is not a good time to sell because in the long term, he believed that Okta would bounce back. And in fact, I think it's already rebounded somewhat since last week when the news came out. So I just thought it would be interesting to talk about because we often say, what is the true cost of the data breach? Is it reputational damage? Is it financial damage? And there definitely was some short-term financial damage here, but I feel like, again, it's it's more like, oh, well, people are going to forget about it and move on, and there's really not going to be that big of a deal, which doesn't bode well for information security because it doesn't provide them a financial incentive to continue to invest in it, is my thought. I've expressed on this show a few times my fear that security incidents, security breaches are becoming so normalized that the specter, the threat of major financial impact has really been lessened. And today there are so many data breaches, security incidents announced every day that there may be short term stock price hit reputational damage, but do those really impact the long term viability of the company, the long-term prospects of the company being successful. Ask yourself this question or go ask people, you know, go ask every single organization where you know they use Okta today and ask them if they plan to drop it. I really can't imagine any company saying yes to that. If they like Okta, they probably plan to stick with them. And I doubt this would change their mind. There may be other reasons, competitive threat, paying in Microsoft are really good too in this space, but I doubt this would cause anybody to change. So ultimately, if you are a shareholder, you hold Okta stock, do you think this impacts the long-term prospects of the company? I, I find it really hard to say yes for many businesses. There may be some, yes, where having a, a data breach, a security incident may impact your long-term ability to attract customers. And maybe then, yeah, it's a good time to get out of the stock. But for a company like Okta, do you really see people dropping them? Because I just don't. I, I I don't know. Maybe I have the wrong point of view on this, but that's my perception is there's no reason to get out of the stock because I don't think there's long-term damage to the company anymore. And again, Andy and I, we lament that from the perspective of security teams receiving funding, receiving support in the organization, the threat of that financial impact was a driver for that. And if that goes away, that hurts our ability to get funding and buy-in from the rest of the organization. One last thought, stock market obviously still matters a lot for some of the financial indicators in our country and in many countries around the world. But keep in mind 
how much of a knee-jerk reaction there is to news today in the stock market and how long-term that really doesn't matter. Microsoft reported our quarterly earnings, our Q2 earnings back in January. And initially when they came out, because of how fast everyone's trying to move, some automated news reporting service, it may have been Bloomberg or something, initially reported that it was a miss, which it was not. It was a a beat on both the top and bottom lines, as they like to say on CNBC and other Wall Street analysts. And yet at first, in after hours trading, Microsoft stock cratered before it recovered and actually wound up being up after hours before trading began the next day. And so that's just another example of even short-term impacts today on the market can be so much of a knee-jerk reaction. It's really hard to read too much into them. That was really eye-opening for me when literally like it was the reporting of Microsoft's earnings that was false. And it actually for a short period of time impacted after hours trading of Microsoft stock. And so I think long-term, yes, Okta will bounce back. I haven't looked at their chart today or anything. Um, so, so, you know, it's an interesting discussion for sure on, on the impact of this. And then just one last thought before we move on, just in terms of having the wherewithal to announce you made a mistake, I think it's huge. I think that's great. Want more companies to do that. It is way more powerful to announce and say you made a mistake and mean it and own it in an apology than it is to use corporate weasel language, which is my least favorite thing in the whole wide world. Clear is kind. So say what you mean and be clear about it. And you know what? I don't blame Okta for having a security incident. As I said last week, those in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And me as a, an employee of a major tech company, I never throw stones about outages, about security incidents or anything else, because what goes around comes around in this business. But I think there are lessons to lo- be learned in clarity of communication, in sincerity of communication, in forthrightness of communication. And this bodes well that Okta will do better at it the next time. And that's what it's all about. Obviously, the goal is to have zero security incidents, but everyone will have them. So the real measure is how you respond to them. And if you're learning and trying to get better, that's the best thing we can ask for. So interesting uh, yeah. first news story to lead off. Yeah, totally agree. So the second story that I thought was interesting and just kind of created some thoughts in my mind to chat about on the show here is Apple released some security updates and it was to address two zero day vulnerabilities that were being exploited in the wild on iPhones, iPads, and Macintoshes. And to date this year, Apple has already patched five zero days. And Having been in an organization, multiple organizations that have deployed MDM for personal devices, I can personally speak to the pain of ensuring compliance on operating system versions for those devices, for personal devices, and the pushback that you get from users when you are forcing them to update. Me being in security... I guess I just assume everyone when they see the little red one on their system setting and that they have an update that everyone just goes and updates it immediately. But apparently they don't do that. Some people wait a very, very long time. Actually, I do know that they don't do that because my wife never does that for her iPhone. I have to update it. So it's uh, it's definitely a pain point. And I guess my thought here is This is something that you're just going to have to get used to, number one, as a security team to continuously update your compliance for operating systems because these patches are going to continuously come out. There's going to be zero days. They're not going to be like Microsoft's Patch Tuesday. They're going to be released whenever they find them, and they're going to patch them right away. And number two is you're going to have to make sure that your users are going to be expecting this. And whether you need to shoot out a communication and tell them within 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, whatever you think is pertinent, 
and then do the update or you just put out the communication and the agreements that they're when they enroll their device that there are going to be patches that will be enforced when they come out something to that effect but i think that this will have to be built in to your device management program in managing these zero day patches going forward My Mac is enrolled with Intune at Microsoft. So it's under managed by Microsoft IT. And Microsoft IT has been very diligent when these updates have come out of sending out an email saying, hey, your Mac is not on the current release of Mac OS. And you need to get there within X days or your device will be marked as non-compliant and then be blocked from accessing all of the things because they're using device-based conditional access with Azure Active Directory, where my device, my Mac OS, Mac Mini, must be marked as compliant in order to access company resources like email, SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, et cetera. The communication's good. The, The timeframes are fair. This is kind of the new world. And I'll admit it's even caught me by surprise because I'm like, gosh, another one? I just did one. Now... Normally, if an update comes out and it doesn't contain zero days, the amount of time you're allowed to get current is longer than it is when it does contain a zero day. Those are the ones where Microsoft IT has been very diligent about giving a very short window to update. So that's a real world example of a a large company and how they're managing enforcing updates to devices. And they're doing the same thing on, on iPhone and iPad as well. Although I tend to do a better job of taking the updates on those. Another interesting thing that came out recently, I saw this over on Mac Rumors, was that Craig Federighi, who is the senior vice president of all software development at Apple, like operating systems and that sort of thing, uh, affectionately known as Hair Force One sometimes. Uh, Craig's great. Anyhow, he was talking about that the automatic updates that are now available on iOS, you know, there's a a slider you can turn to enable automatic updates on your iOS, iPhone, iPad devices. That doesn't just like kick off automatically. It's not like, oh, an update's out, download it and install it. Next time I'm on the charger. Apple actually announced for the first time, and you could kind of surmise this through behavior, but it's never been publicly disclosed, that they are doing like quality gating before they start to push that automatic update out to devices out there in the wild. So much the same as Windows, where if you've ever listened to Windows Weekly with Leo Laporte and uh, Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley, they have this term for people that go to Windows Update and try to get updates. They call them seekers. And a lot of times on Windows Updates, if you go seek them, you get them first before they're automatically pushed out. Now, that normally applies more so to things like feature updates going from 20H1 to 20H2 on Windows 10, etc., Um, however, it sounds like the story is much the same now for iOS updates. If you're a seeker, you can pull it up and install it right away. If you don't seek, it will take time to it for it to get pushed to your device and automatically update. And those intervals seem relatively long where you can be on a down level version for, I've seen it almost weeks now and I haven't automatically updated. I've been getting again, pinged by Microsoft it because my iPhone is enrolled as well saying, Hey, you need to update. So one last interesting data point on this subject too, with, with all these updates and patches coming out, I have a friend who works for a security, we'll call them kind of a startup. They're, they're kind of past that stage, but they're not too full, like enterprise maturity. They're in, in this middle spot and they don't use MDM. Like their, their CTO is against MDM as a concept, which is interesting. So they have their Windows PCs and their Mac OS devices are unmanaged. However, they're all part of an enterprise and they're a security company. So obviously there's that expectation of keeping them up to date. And they had released some data showing the distribution of operating system versions for Windows and Mac OS. And I have to say, even as a Microsoft employee, as even somebody who uh, likes to drink the champagne, if you will, Windows beat out Mac OS in terms of devices that were on current rev by a lot, not by a little, by a lot. So 
I, I, I calculated the stats in my head as he shared them with me because we thought they were interesting. And again, these are unmanaged devices. So this is like a, a really good real world test of, hey, you have a bunch of security professionals who work for a security company. How good are they doing at keeping their OS up to date? On Windows, it was something like 55 or 60% of devices were either on the current build of Windows 10 or Windows 11. Over on Mac OS, it was closer to 20%. Again, the plural of anecdote is not data, and I am not pretending it is, but I thought that was an interesting example where you have a, a biz, small, medium business environment, uh, ostensibly a security company, unmanaged. How well do those systems kind of keep themselves up to date? Lately, it seems like Windows is doing a better job of it, which is awesome. You know, Windows is is much more broadly used than Mac OS. So I think that's great from a security perspective. Uh, but it's also just interesting um, that Apple has built a lot of intelligence and, and ML and machine learning into when they're going to push updates on iOS and Mac OS. However, it seems like they are not in a big hurry to do it. And maybe that is a little bit concerning. Maybe we'd like to see a little more pace with those zero days, but some uh, interesting conversation here for sure. And I think the takeaway for our listeners, for those security professionals of the world, Andy already touched on this. You need to get to a point where you have buy-in to enforce operating system versions in your compliance policies. And that's going to be have, have to be done on a reasonable time frame. And I think back to when I, did MDM before I joined Microsoft. So five, six, seven years ago now. And I always had very loose policies. You know, this, it was a different time, but I think I let people be like one whole major release behind. And so coming today where it's like, Oh, there's a point release point two, you better get on it. That is a totally different mindset than before, but it has to be. And that's, uh, that's our job as security professionals. Yeah, I, I like how you mentioned how Microsoft does it because my personal phone is not enrolled in MDM with Microsoft. And so sometimes I remember I hear heard you say, oh, I had to update my iOS um, operating system today or something like that. And I didn't have that update because I wasn't getting pinged on it. If you're not a seeker and constantly checking, then... As Adam said, you'll notice that Apple kind of rolls them out slowly with these quality checks. And so you may not be getting that update pushed to you right away. Part of Microsoft's compliance on mobile devices, as well as you know Windows and Mac OS as well, is that you have to have Defender for Endpoint installed. Now, again, there are a lot of different vendors out there, a lot of different endpoint protection, but I, well, this is one of the first times that I've ever put endpoint protection on a mobile phone that I'm carrying around. And what I do like about Defender for Endpoint in general is that before they push out the compliance policy and says, hey, you're out of compliant, Defender for Endpoint will just give you a notification and say, there's an update that your operating system is out of date. And then you start getting the messages from Microsoft IT saying, if you don't update, you will be out of compliance. And they don't switch that until the time frame that they dictate. So it's a nice reminder to, you know, if you have an endpoint protection and you're pushing it out to your corporate devices, people who are enrolled and have access to your corporate data, it can be a, a push in the right direction. Because for me, seeing that on one of my phones, and saying, oh, I have access to corporate data. This is Microsoft's thing. I better update. That may be the mindset that, uh, at least the thought process that will go through a user's mind. So I actually have a demo tenant that I use for demonstration purposes for Microsoft, which is not owned by Microsoft IT. And I enrolled my personal phone into that for MDM and installed Defender for Endpoint on that phone just so I can get the notifications that there is an operating system update so that I can go and seek it out. And that's, that's how I manage my phones. But yeah, it's, you can definitely notice that Apple doesn't push those things right away for every single user. Cause they'll, they'll get it in different waves. 
So the next story I have is from Krebs on security, Brian Krebs. He has a security blog, and I thought this was super interesting. This tactic that we're going to talk about has actually been used by Lapsus and other cyber criminals, but there is a way that cyber criminals are compromising government agencies like police departments and getting access to their email accounts and then sending out what are called emergency data requests to mobile providers, ISPs, and social media companies to get access to sensitive customer data. These emergency data requests, or EDRs they're called, are requests that should be complied with when there's a life or death situation that they need access to this data right away. It is different than a subpoena or a search warrant, which requires a judge's signature. And many companies have complied with these EDRs. There's actually been known companies that have requ- that have been given these EDRs by cyber criminals from compromised email accounts in these police departments and government agencies. And it's very hard for these companies to differentiate in a timely fashion if these EDRs are legitimate or not. It's not like it requires a judge's signature, although there have been known instances again of forged search warrants and subpoenas where the cyber criminals will copy and paste the signature of the judge from a different, you know, if you have electronic records, they can just copy that signature and put it onto an, another one. But these EDRs, it's very difficult to tell. And if it's supposed to be actually life and death, you want to respond in a timely fashion. And so I just thought it was a really interesting tactic. And it goes to speak that cyber criminals are constantly changing their way of getting into a company and getting data. And we had talked about having good collaboration between different departments within your organization. Legal is for sure one of them. And this is something that, you know, when you receive this type of method that is being used to exfiltrate customer data, you need to notify your legal department and kind of step up their game and make sure that you're protected from that aspect. My first thought here is that as bad of a job as hackers do at creating phishing emails, I am shocked they were able to do these in a way that is credible and believable because I've just seen very, very, very few phishing emails that are spot on. There's always typos and grammatical errors and like formatting errors. And so the, the fact that you could send this to a tech company and go, Oh, well, I guess it's fine. Like that, that that's shocking to me in part, just based on the history of attackers ability to create believable looking forgeries. So just a, a little bit of humor there, but, but also some seriousness that, that I'm surprised by that. The other piece this reminds me of, and this goes all the way back to the San Bernardino shooter case where the FBI was attempting to coerce Apple into creating a backdoor in iOS and Apple refusing. And Apple's thought process was essentially if you create a backdoor and create a key for it, that key becomes an attractive target. And uh, there is no perfect system to keep it perfectly secure. This reminds me of that, where now that you have created this process, this emergency data request, where you can demand information without the same level of scrutiny as a subpoena, as a search warrant, that becomes an attractive target. If EDRs didn't exist, it wouldn't be a potential compromise. And so going back to that idea, what if there was a backdoor key that 
you could go request from Apple for iOS to break into phones? And what if the attackers were breaking into government and police department email accounts to request that backdoor key to the FBI OS they were asking them to make? Like, that's all a really good thought exercise. If you even took the side of the government and FBI at the time and saying, yeah, you know, what, what is Apple abating, abetting terrorists here by not helping with this investigation? It's just the fact that when you create a backdoor through security, that is something that can be used by the bad guys too, because there is no perfect method of securing it. And this is a perfect example of that. And so Andy, I think your call out to our listeners and security defenders everywhere is obviously apply more scrutiny to these and, and build up process with collaboration between legal and infosec to, to really give these a thorough look and do any sort of due diligence you can again in a timely fashion, because it is life and death before de- determining whether or not to comply with the order. But this is, um, it, it's just a perfect example of the, the never ending battle in security that when you create a super user, a, a super privilege, a way of privilege escalation like this, a backdoor, it's going to be compromised. And so hats off to Apple for standing their ground and not building a backdoor into iOS. I am thankful reading this story right here. That's the first thing it reminded me of. And I am thankful for that because it proves insecurity. The best security is not having a backdoor, not having a universal key. And so this is a, this is very, very scary because again, like you, you, of course your instinct for good to help humans, to help people overrides your concern to, to be cautious and trepidatious about these requests. But my goodness, I I mean, I, I am very happy. I don't have to deal with this because what a challenge to work through and try to build process around something that by its very nature needs to be a quick response. I don't envy those who have to deal with that. The other thought process that I had when I was kind of going through all of these stories here is how important threat intelligence is becoming in our industry. And I had talked recently with a information security manager at a large banking company and how he had put together a, an internal threat intelligence shop where their job full time was to look over stories like this to gather information tactics of what cyber criminals are doing and things like patches like this like knowing all of this because Honestly, it's it's too much for most organizations, for most security defenders to stay up on the news as well as triage incidents and work on projects to deploy new tools. I mean, there's there's so much that defenders are being asked to do today. Threat intelligence is a whole other aspect, and we can talk about this on another show, but I just thought whether or not you have to stand up your own or you try to do it yourself, or maybe you farm it out to a vendor. I mean, there are vendors out there that specialize in threat intelligence like Recorded Future. There's also tools that have threat intelligence feeds built in, like Defender for Endpoint has a threat intelligence feed. I know CrowdStrike has a threat intelligence feed, and those are built into their endpoint protection, and it goes over different CVEs. But... I think there is benefit in having a full-time shop and having people focus specifically on this and then getting basically kind of a daily briefing, right? Like their job is to go through the news and then, you know, maybe meet first thing in the morning at a stand up or something like that for 30 minutes. And here's the things that are happening in the world. As far as threat intelligence goes, this is what's impacting the financial sector. If you're a banking company, or this is what's impacting the healthcare sector or things like that. And so that's, another thought that kind of popped into my head. And again, we can talk about threat intelligence on another show, but um, I just wanted to mention that. Our final story for the night 
is talking about PCI and the latest PCI DSS or data security standard was published recently. And just wanted to talk through some of the changes. PCI compliance is required for anyone who's processing credit card payments. And so there's a set of standards. Usually if you are processing credit cards, you will know that you fall under PCI compliance. And so the new standard is 4.0. The most recent standard previous to that was 3.2.1, which was published back in 2018. And so a lot of things obviously have changed since 2018. We had a pandemic, if you haven't noticed, and a lot of people are shopping online. So a lot of credit card transactions happen online nowadays. Technology has evolved. And so... PCI fortunately has come out and made some of those changes to their compliance standards. So the key high level goals for PCI 4.0 is ensuring that the standard continues to meet the security needs of the payment industry, add flexibility and support of additional methodologies to achieve security, which I think is probably one of the most important changes Previous versions of PCI had very rigid methodologies that didn't really meet modern technology. And now it's written more generally. So in, say, for example, MFA, the new standard allows you to have a little bit more flexibility to pick a vendor of your choice and implement it that way, whereas the old standards were a little bit more rigid in how they defined. And so you're kind of playing that, you know, deploying to the compliance standards rather than deploying to the security standards and then kind of explaining how that meets the compliance standard. So I think there are some good changes. Uh, They also wanted to promote security as a continuous process and then enhance some of the validation methods and procedures. So starting off with identity and access management, they provided some more guidance on digital identity for authentication and lifecycle management and multi-factor authentication is being required for all accounts that have access to cardholder data, not just the administrators who are accessing the cardholder data, which is a, is a new change. They're still requiring password rotation, which I think, you know, unfortunately that's just part of standards, not catching up or not understanding some of the tools that are out there, but they're requiring passwords to be rotated every 12 months. I thought this was also interesting. Strong passwords need to be used and they must contain at least 15 characters alphanumeric. So 15 characters and they must be compared against a list of known bad passwords. Access privileges must be reviewed every six months And then vendor or third-party accounts may only be enabled as needed or monitored when in use. So a lot lot of good things there. Some things I personally would like to see updated a little bit more, but probably have to wait till, you know, later versions. Um, And that's just the reality of still having passwords in our security stack. There's a lot here. I was disappointed and specifically zoomed in on those two things you talked about is with passwords as well. I was encouraged by a lot of what you were talking about with standard modernization, uh, disappointed by those two things on passwords, although it's not the end of the world. I have seen and worked with customers who have told me that their requirement to meet a standard and insert standard here is holding them back from embracing cloud technology, using a new tool for this or for that. In some ways, these standards don't actually raise the bar for security. They lower it because of them being written in such a rigid fashion and because they're written before, you know, current day, right? That's that's the nature of a standard. It's, It's from before because now today I'm, I'm looking back at this standard that was written two, three, four years ago and trying to implement it. And so that's, that's the other problem is they just don't 
keep up with the times as effectively. And so I like what I'm hearing around more of a framework, you know, here's the ideas you need to implement and you have flexibility into the, how you implement them. Those are all very good things. So that's encouraging. And, and I will say actually overall in all the standards that I have run into and in my day job, PCI DSS has not been one of the more, the, the worst offenders in, in terms of holding organizations back. There's a lot of principles there that are actually pretty good and have been pretty good. So this is one of the better ones and, and certainly not going to pick on them a whole heck of a lot. By the way, I don't know if we actually said it out loud, but PCI stands for payment card information. Um, and then you did spell out what DSS stood for Andy. So good stuff here. Mixed bag, I'd say, but, but overall good. Yeah. Yeah. And then they did update some stuff on data encryption as well which now will have a, a broader um, applicability to um, ex- ex- encrypting cardholder data to include trusted networks, which wasn't included previously, um, which is good. In a zero trust environment, you want to uh, make sure that your data is encrypted on your network as well as off network, right? Mm-hmm. And then there was a requirement for data discovery to locate all sources and locations of clear text primary account numbers uh, more frequently. So they defined it as every at least every 12 months or, or any significant change to cardholder data environment that you must kind of do a discovery and see if you have any clear text in there. Um, but yeah, I think overall the biggest change is the flexibility. So in, instead of having to follow a method prescribed by the standard you can focus on achieving an outcome of an objective that the pci dss defines rather than saying that you must use this particular compensating control so i think that is a good thing um, overall and that's kind of the overarching change and then the other thing is the timeline. So the current version, which is 3.2.1 will still remain active for two years. And the transition period will end on March 31st, 2024. And so you're going to get two years to transition to that. And you're going to get time to do that. And then once the transition period has ended, version 4.0 will be the only active standard. But again, like Adam said, it's, I do, again, find it a little bit disappointing because it's a fairly long time. I mean, 2018 was when the last standard was published. And so that was, what, like four years ago? And then you're going to get two years for a transition, and then it'll be 4.0. And then most likely they're probably not going to publish another version until, say, 2026, another four years. So... A lot can change in technology in that amount of time. And, you know, we talk about passwordless all the time. And something like this would, I think, hold back an organization from going to passwordless because they define that you need to have password rotation and you need to have strong passwords. And it doesn't really say anything about not having passwords. So, you know, it's really holding back the organization. Like Adam said, it's it can be a, a d- deterrent to move to modern technology. It, it, it's interesting the two different takes. Yeah, I, I I was thinking something similar as I looked at the transition period and I was doing the math in my head. I'm like, okay, that's that's six years after the standard came out, it will be finally sunset. That is a fairly long time, but at the same time, I I, I think of large enterprises, especially enterprises that do and handle a lot of payment card information. And I thought, gosh, two years isn't that long. So it's weird, right? Where obviously I want everybody to move faster. I want old standards to die faster. But at the same time, like I I do feel for organizations, like here's the new standards. You got two years to implement them. And, And I think in some cases that that can be challenging. Uh, so it's, it's a double-edged sword, right? I mean, we all just need to get better at moving faster. And, and I think that's part of it too, is sometimes when you think about how long it takes to accomplish things 
And then you think about how fast things get done under duress. Not that we should work under duress all the time. And, and every sock analyst is laughing right now because they say I already do bro, but <laughs> we, uh, we just got to get better at moving faster. So th- this is uh again, total mixed bag here, but PCI DSS has never been the worst offender in this space. I hope all standards bodies continue to evolve to like you talked about Andy dictating outcomes more than implementations. Right. And I think as we get down that path, we, everyone will be better off because gosh, it's not that long ago. I remember working with, with customers and them saying crazy things like we can't go to the cloud because of this. Like, what do you mean? And you know, as you dig into it, you're like, all right, yeah, I see that. That's crazy. Um, we, we've got to empower organizations to do what's right for them. Um, but at the same time, maintain the integrity, security, confidentiality, et cetera, of their whatever data they, that's been entrusted to them. And especially in payment card information. I mean, my gosh, everyone who's had their, their payment card information compromised has been frustrated by that. Um, although it sure seems to be a lot more physical compromise than it seems to be cybersecurity compromise. And now that I say that, that will change, but uh, it, it sure seems to, in, in my experience, you know, it's been like, oh yeah, I went to Qdoba and their card reader was skimming or something and I had to get a new card. You know, that seems to happen a lot more frequently than, you know, somebody stole my payment card information from Amazon. So interesting news this week, three and yeah. four very different uh, stories. Yeah, I thought it was really good. And and in my head, it was kind of going through some of the tenets of cybersecurity that we don't always touch on, like threat intelligence and compliance. And I think as defenders, it's still something that we should stay at least current on and have a basic understanding, especially if it impacts our organization like PCI. If you don't process credit card information, then you can disregard it. But having an idea of what the standards are. If you ever go work for a company that has to adhere to these standards, like for example, I worked at one company that was a private company and then I went to work for another one that was a publicly traded company and we had to perform SOX audits, which are only for publicly traded companies. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that SOX audits existed (laughs) and what they consisted of, but I learned that they were a thing. So, you know, I, I, these, these things come up, and if you don't have experience in them, hopefully we can bring some awareness to you through this podcast. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about. Thanks, we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.